Thank you very much for staying. Welcome back. The government says it is bent on harmonizing finances of the energy sector to avoid recurrence of the energy sector debt, which now stands at about 10 billion Ghana cities. That's the assertion of Deputy Energy Minister Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam. Government last week failed to raise all the 6 billion city target for the 10 year energy bond to help clear the energy sector debt and therefore extended the offer period. In an interview with Joy Business, Energy Minister Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam noted the introduction of the cash waterfall policy, among other interventions, will ensure the cash flow position of all players in the value chain of the energy sector is improved. The government has announced a number of uh, uh, interventions to uh, address the financial challenges facing our utilities. The energy bond is one initiative, one big initiative that will clean the, the balance sheet of the of the utilities and put them back in business. You know, so they can be able to deal with their creditors. They can be able to buy uh, crude oil. They can be able to pay for the gas, which is sold to them both by the West Africa gas pipeline and then by Atwabu uh, uh, Ghana gas and, and therefore if we sanitize their balance sheet it is important we do not accumulate, accumulate new debts. This is why government has announced an additional initiative, a measure that we call the cash waterfall uh, system. The cash waterfall system is to ensure that cash flow is not restrained, it's not constrained. Therefore, once ECG makes the collections, there is a formula by which every player in the value chain will have their fair share of the revenue so that nobody is found wanting. Nobody goes to buy light crude oil and is not able to find money to pay. And so we need the cash to flow through the value chain. VRA should get its cash for selling power to ECG. The light crude oil uh, supplier should get their cash for selling light crude oil to ECG. The banking sector, which is most affected by the you know, legacy debts, they also need to be revived because the non-performing loans you know, are quite huge and that is reducing the competitiveness of the banking industry. And so if the bond clears the debt, the banking industry is going to be revived, you know, and so that they are in a better position to lend out more money to those who deserve or who need it. So government is not just bringing the, the bond, we are also, you know, implementing a cash waterfall mechanism to ensure that there is no further accumulation of, of debt. The third, you know, arm of the, of the intervention is ECG itself, because if we're talking about ECG collecting and sharing the revenue among all the players in the value chain, and ECG doesn't collect much, then you will accumulate new debts. And so government is concerned about the, the revival of ECG. You know, the business model we want to introduce through the uh, Millennium Challenge Compact is going to position ECG to become financially viable, to become efficient. And in addition to this, government is working with ECG to roll out, you know, our revenue improvement measures. And in another development, Deputy Energy Minister Dr. Adam says, or has been explaining, the LPG promotion policy of government and the cylinder recirculation model to improve safety in the downstream petroleum sector. The LPG uh, distribution policy, uh, which we call the National LPG Promotion Policy, it is not about cylinder recirculation alone. It, it deals with the entire L LPG value chain, you know, from the processing uh, of LPG through to transportation of LPG through to the use, the utilization of LPG, because we want to be able to increase LPG penetration to about 50% by the year 2020. And we should be able to go up to 100% over the next uh, six, eight years, because this is the cleaner uh, fuel that we have in this world, the most clean fuel, and we want Ghanaians to be using uh, the cleanest fuel. And so it's not just about cylinder recirculation. The cylinder recirculation is a model, it's an instrument to just implement an aspect of the LPG promotion policy. And so we shouldn't confuse the LPG promotion policy with the cylinder recirculation. You know, when you have a policy, you then have instruments or tools for implementing various aspects of the policy. It, it borders on safety, it borders on health, it borders on security, then it borders on the distribution of the LPG itself. 
And so the cylinder recirculation model is addressing the LPG distribution challenges to make it more efficient and to make the, the, the consumer the king. In which case, you don't need to go looking for uh, LPG stations to fill your cylinder. They have to bring the cylinder to you, filled, either at the distribution center or to your home. We want to make the consumer the king. And if you make the consumer the king, we can then hold responsible all those who are, who are, who are involved in the distribution chain to ensure that there is safety, to ensure that the cylinders are maintained well, you know, to ensure that we avoid the accidents. And this is also to address safety because we have understand about 600 you know, uh, LPG distribution centers outlets around the, the country. And so if we decongest our you know, country, with the many stations dotted around through the development of huge LPG refill stations or what we call bottling stations who are dotted you know, outside the, the population centers and that are also few, then we are able to manage them. Let's now move away from energy and some tourism industry players have been outlining how the sector can be best managed to improve penetration. This follows a maiden report by the Ghana Statistical Service on domestic and outbound tourism survey speaking to Joy Business. The public relations and marketing manager of Jumia Travels, Bennett Otu, identified some causes hampering the development of the tourism sector and suggests ways by which the industry can be effectively managed. Tourism continues to be a significant contributor to national development in Ghana. It is a major source of foreign exchange earnings as well as employment. According to the Domestic and Outbound Tourism Report issued by the Ghana Statistical Service for the year 2015, Ghanaians are said to be spending more time and money on funerals than on leisure. It says 24.3% of total expenditure of domestic tourism spent on funerals as compared to 2.9% on leisure. The report reveals domestic and outbound tourism constituted 698.4 million cities. Public relations and marketing manager of Jumia Travels, Bennett Otu, outlines some factors that have contributed to this development in the sector. Traveling from Ghana to, let's say, a country like uh, Dubai is actually, is actually cheaper compared to traveling from Accra to, let's say, um, Tamale to spend a week. Um, if, I, if I want to give you exact figures, there are packages that allow people to travel from, from Ghana to Dubai for around 1,200, 1,500 US dollars. Now, the same 1,500 US dollars can take you from Accra to, to let's say, Zena Lodge or to another um, um, five-star hotel or four-star hotel in Ghana, but you would spend more there because apart from the room that you are paying for, apart from the hotel fees you are paying, you would have to buy food for yourself. You have to pay um, for every activity you undertake. Every Bennett Otu suggested some solutions that could go a long way to boost tourism penetration in Ghana. We've heard that government is gradually reducing some taxes and that's going to translate into reduced overhead costs for these hotels and these other um, hospitality ventures that are around us. That is good. But I think that let's try as much as possible to put government on the side because we have a responsibility. First of all, if government reduces the costs and then the hotels are cheap, but we still don't have that culture of traveling, we, that we, we are still not interested in traveling, in, in tourism. We've not painted that image. We've not created an atmosphere of, of travel for anybody. The taxes can reduce, the rates can reduce, but nobody will still go. He is, however, optimistic. The tourism industry would see a major boost by the end of the year if some solutions are pursued. I think that this year, tourism would get a boost. Um, tourism will get a major boost because of the, the, the plans and then the activities that have gone on. Um, this year, we've had two big international events being hosted in Africa for the first time in Ghana. So it threw a lot of light, a lot of attention on our country. We had the World Tourism Forum and then we had the air show recently. Now, these events are big. They've been done elsewhere around the world. This is the first time it was brought to Africa. So we had international media throwing more light on Ghana, people who have never heard of Ghana, hearing about Ghana, people wanting to visit 
I've had a few requests from people asking, what do you have in Ghana? What can I see when I come to Ghana? So, yes, we see the interest there. We see the policies being put in place. We see a lot of um, energy in the, in the tourism sector. We see the drive. Most importantly, um, Doomso, as we put it, has, has more or less stopped. The number of annual international visitors to Ghana, according to the report, is about 950,000 and is expected to grow to 1.5 million by 2024. Let's have some highlights of the report. still on the marketplace. Now, there are fears that the country may have some challenges in convincing investors that Ghana is a preferred destination for doing business in the region. It follows a new World Bank report which showed that the country went down by 12 places to 120 in the latest ease of doing business report. Now, George Rafi has been following up on this issue and has joined me right here in the studio to give us some more clarity on this. Now, George, what is the basis for this the fear the concern exactly. and you look at the jp morgans these big time investors you look at exxon Mobil, and for these investors when they are coming into a country they have a checklist that they will look at that how are things doing in this country if we bring in our capital how can we ensure that they are protected now some of these key variables that the world bank looked at you look at 10 pillars there's one that is talking about enforcement of contracts we're down by two places. Maybe that is marginal. Let's look at registration of properties. The challenges that businesses are likely to face when they are registering business. They were, we're down by 42 places, we are faced, from 77 in 2017 when they did their report to 119. Let's also look at dealing with contracts as well. Now look at that one. We're also down by 14 places from 117 to 131. And for some of these investors, if they are coming in, they look at some of these things. And if the likelihood that it's going to be more difficult for them in bringing in their capital, enforcement of contracts, and all those things, that could again delay the period in bringing in this capital. Okay. But let's look at the other side. And if you have again an examinable company into Ghana, if they have not started already, we are fair they will take about two or three years to move in their capital and their equipment. So sure. for some of these investors, they will tell you that, yes, this report would influence our decision, but if we have a sense that things are going to improve, the forward looking, because if they bring in or they start moving into Ghana, in terms of actual exploration, it will take them about two to three years, and right. even ripping on their capital and all the rest. So right. they will say that, yes, this report is critical, but if we have an indication that things are going to improve, then we'll bring in the capital. Now, George, there have been some arguments concerning when exactly mm. this, you know, assessment... I, I, I know you are, you are all, all this that school of thoughts exactly, about exactly. why 2018 and why isn't it looking at last year? And the what fact that we are putting in place some measures to improve the business climate currently... Okay, so if, if you look at how they did this report, mm. they started it from in June 2016. Okay. Look at that year, up to June 2007. So... 17. 2017, sorry. So when it comes to access to credit, what are some of those things that impact or affect you as a small business to get access to credit to start a business? Let's look at enforcement of contracts. Who are those relevant agencies that are supposed to enforce them? The courts, the regulatory agencies, and all the rest. What are some of the challenges that businesses in Ghana are facing when it comes to enforcement of contracts? But again, there's an interesting thing when you go through this report, we are Despite the fact that in terms of, of our overall score of 100, where we are about 57, we hadn't lost much marks. It looks like other countries are putting in a lot more reforms. So they are leaping better than us. And therefore, even though we are dropping so well in these means, that other countries who are also captured in this report are doing very well. Rwanda, 
He's doing some marvelous things, we are saying, that is pushing it up. Mauritius, Obviously. Obviously. Kenya. But, but, but I just want to know, so does it mean that looking forward or moving forward, we're going to improve this performance? Because I know government has put in place some well, remarkable since measures. Well, since April this year, mm. you're looking at the paperless system, which exactly. again will improve the turnaround time for doing business at our port. We look at the court systems and all the rest, access to credit and all those things. Registration of business. Cutting down of taxes that businesses are supposed to, what do you call it, uh, pay on their, to government and all those things. Recently, the Registrar General's Department also did this electronic oh, wow. payment, electronic registration and all those things. So with these reforms, maybe in the 2019 report, we could see Ghana uh, leaping forward. If the other countries, that's where the economists will say, all other things being equal. In equal here, let the other countries hold on to their reforms <laughs> and let Ghana leap for it. Right. Now, is government contesting this position? Because we hear the GIPC has uh, been describing this performance to the measures that have not taken place yet. Mm -hmm. what, in, uh, the, Depending uh, on the government agency that you might engage, they might come up with different views. But engaging some persons within government, they admit that there's a problem. But they believe that if this report captured or expanded to this year, maybe August and all those things. Some of the reforms that they had implemented would have seen Ghana doing much better than what we've seen. But they were of the view that uh, the 2019 report uh, will see Ghana uh, making some progress in them, and therefore that's... But there was a bit about payment of taxes, and I put those questions to the GRA Commissioner, Emmanuel Kupinti, and he was contesting that, and he believes that if you should walk into the offices today, he doesn't think that businesses are really having some challenges in paying their taxes. So okay. you can uh, walk into the office and try paying your taxes and see whether it will take you more time if you are <laughs> indeed honoring your obligations. You Thank you very much Thank for you so that much. insight. George Riafi bringing us up to speed on Ghana's current position in the 2018 Ease of Doing Business report released by the World Bank recently. Now, away from this, captains of industry in the mining sector are calling on government to create an enabling business environment for the participation of nationals in the extractive sector. A report by the Africa Center for Energy Transformation indicates that one of the main challenges faced, faced by Ghana's mining sector is the insufficient investment incentives. The sector's contribution is most pronounced in monetary creation of multiplier contributions to the economy. Indeed, in 2013, the Chamber and the International Council of Mining and Metals engaged Stuart Red Queen and the African Center for Economic Transformation to undertake a study on the life cycle contribution of the mining industry to Ghana's economy. The findings of the study suggest that Ghana's mining sector contributes about 3.2% to the GDP of Ghana. In monetary terms, we're looking at about 1.5 billion at that time, the report said. It also revealed that demand for goods, excluding diesel and, le <coughs> sorry, and electricity, by producing member companies of the chamber, averaged more than $1 billion in each of the last seven years. Indeed, diesel and electricity put together account for over 600 million, in addition to that. In order to maximize the opportunities inherent in the value chain of the mining industry, the Chamber in 2014, and this shows that the Chamber has been at the forefront of thought leadership around this issue, around this issue for many years. And that was the president of the Chamber of Mines, uh, Kwame Adukufo. Now, Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Barbara Oting Jesse, says government is concerned about the low participation of nationals in the extractive sector. According to her, new policies will be rolled out to diversify the economy by empowering the local private sector in the gold supply value chain. A strong and trusted partnership between the industry and local supplies. The program will ensure that there is a mechanism for regular consultations, but more importantly, for joint initiatives and strategic development so that the mining sector can truly benefit our economy and our people. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I conclude by the 
I conclude my statement by appealing to all of us to embrace and lend our support to the National Suppliers Development Program to ensure its success, to facilitate the optimization of the benefits of the mining industry for our country and our people. Now, the Abuso Kai spare parts market is one of the biggest markets for imported vehicle spare parts. Jostling through the market to search for even the smallest of spare parts can be very tiring. It is to save vehicle owners a sweat that entrepreneur Vanel Mauli Jiba started Abuso Kai online, an online auto market. He's an, uh, he has an interesting story to tell on this edition of the Joy Business Van, which brings you a repeat. Thousands of shops selling imported vehicle spare parts. I'm at one of Ghana's biggest spare parts market, Abosilkai, today with Vanel Malijigba undertaking one of the most difficult or stressful exercises shopping for auto spare parts. <music> Vanel does not enjoy being here because of the crowded and busy nature of the market. That, coupled with bad experiences with mechanics, made him start Abosilkai Online, an online market for spare parts. I used to import vehicles into the country and I had this mechanic um, who would always um, double prices for me whenever I needed spare parts. Uh, sometimes triple the prices and so uh, at a point I thought that there were so many people in my shoes um, who couldn't be sure of what they were buying and couldn't be sure of the right prices and so it just happened that one early morning I called one guy who was living with me I said listen today Abosokai online starts and you are the first stop and it just happened. That was two years ago when the telecom consultant Vanel decided to make the move. So um, basically we had to sort out our technological needs and so a portal where um, people could come make their request and then basically a social media page to create the awareness. That really helped to build the client base of Abosokai online. Um, say you needed uh, a Mercedes-Benz um, Struts or shocks, shock absorbers. Um, you basically go to our website www.abosokaionline.com.gh, type that there. Um, if you don't find it there, we have um, a button that makes you uh, send your request across to the back end for us to um, give you your quotes. Now, if you find your parts there, then what you do is um, pay. Uh, basically we are we integrated with um, some payment platform so you could uh, just go ahead and enter your details and then uh, pay online via mobile money or via any of uh, the debit cards and then um, just purchase and it's as simple as that and then we have it delivered to you wherever you are in the country basically today our kind online receives 150 calls and messages asking for spare parts to be delivered once the orders are made, Vanel and his team head to the market in search of the parts requested. Okay, thanks, yeah. yeah. Effectively meeting the needs of customers means Vanel has to build a good network of suppliers. One of the hurdles for Vanel was convincing vendors to migrate to his online platform. You know, we have a lot of superstition around people don't want others to know about their prizes, they don't want people to take images of their items, and it's been a real challenge, but uh, we kept on driving it home that, listen, we are in a digital age, uh, we stand a better chance joining the bandwagon, and that is how uh, we've been able to um, go around it till now. But things have actually gone better than expected. Abosokai Online is fast growing as more Ghanaians become acquainted with e-commerce. The online platform was the Jazz the 2017 Best Online Auto Market at the Ghana Auto Awards. Now, Abosokai Online runs on an app too and deliveries are all over the country and beyond. Are we hoping to have um, 
a very um, digitized market, spare parts market, where no one will really bother to um, come to the market b before having um, quality or having affordability. We're looking at um, getting to a point where Ghanaians could just uh, know that I have Abosokai online to rely on for all my quality spare parts. And in that way, um, the vendors as well gain the benefit of having um, the market spread out across the world. No more hassle, no more stress if you're a vehicle owner. So you catch uh, the Joy Business Van every Wednesday on Business Live with a repeat on Thursdays on the Marketplace. And this is where we draw the curtain down on this afternoon's edition of Marketplace. My name is Emmanuel Abouaji Riafe. Many thanks for watching. Do join me again same time tomorrow. Good afternoon.